The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all. Uh, I'm Ridhul, behalf of Care Ratings. Welcome you to our today's webinar on a primer on crude oil. Uh, appreciate your time. Our, sp our speakers for today is uh, Mr. Manik Narang, who will be joining us from our uh, Delhi office. He is the Associate Director at Care Ratings. And from Mumbai office, we have Urvisha Jagasheth, a research analyst from the industry research team. The discussion is in form of a presentation which is visible on your screen. We'll be having a Q&A session no sooner the presentation ends. Uh, in case of any queries, you are please requested to key in in the slot provided. Uh, may I uh, request Urvisha to begin the proceedings? Thank you, Mridal. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Crude oil is an important energy resource which underpins the fuel requirements of a global economy and the oil products supply power for transport, domestic, commercial and industrial needs. It is also one of the most economically mature commodities in the world and is majorly traded across commodity exchanges. India is the third largest importer and consumer of crude oil but on the other hand is imperiled to limited oil reserves in the country. Hence, changes in crude oil price and global demand supply directly affects the Indian economy. In this webinar, we will first be discussing India's position in terms of demand and supply, the trend in crude oil prices, its weight in the inflation indices, the implicit impact of the oil and gas sector on the government balances, and lastly, the ratings movement and dispersion in the oil and gas sector. The first slide contains a graph depicting the trend in domestic production of crude oil in the last five years and the level of production achieved in the current fiscal year as well. But before we discuss the production numbers, let's provide a little background on how hydrocarbon exploration is carried out in India. Initially, exploration is carried forth by national oil companies ONGC and Oil India through a nomination regime and private companies were allowed to enter into exploration through a joint venture with N these NOCs. This was applicable under the pre-NELP regime. Subsequently, 100% foreign participation in exploration was allowed in the new exploration and licensing policy, which is also known as NELP. Currently, as of March 2016 onwards, India has been awarding oil and gas blocks under the Hydrocarbon Exploration and Licensing Policy, which is being monitored by the Directorate General of Hydrocarbon. HELP is a new fiscal model based on revenue sharing contract. This is an upgraded version as compared to the NELP and the production sharing contracts. Under the HELP regime, the government will not be concerned with the costs incurred and will receive a share of the gross revenue from the share of sale of oil and gas. Since NELP was introduced in the late 1990s, 314 blocks have been offered under various auction rounds, of which 254 have been awarded. There are 60 NELP blocks that are operational today by players such as ONGC, Reliance Industries and Oil India. From 2017, all new contracts have been signed under the HELP regime. Most of the producing blocks in the country at present are those that have been offered before the NELP or after the NELP. All these production sharing contracts have a life. ONGC is the largest oil explorer in the country and contributes to around 60% of the total domestic production, whereas Oil India contributes to the next remaining 9 to 10%. The remaining 30% production is undertaken by private companies. Now back to our production numbers. It is very noticeable that the crude oil production has declined over the years. The primary reason which can be attributable to the same is because of the loss of output due to the maturing of oil fields and the inability to further dig deeper to explore more oil. The same trend has continued in the current financial year as well, with the production dropping by 6% in the April-January period. 
Next up, we have imports. India imports more than 80% of its crude oil requirements and, is in the, and in the current financial year, we have imported almost 4.5 million barrels per day. Our import dependency based on consumption has also increased to 85% as compared with it being 83% a year ago in the same period. Imports of crude oil have grown at a compounded annual growth rate of 4.6% during financial year 15 to 19. But in the current financial year in the April-January period, imports have declined marginally by 0.9%. The compliance of US sanctions on Iran, May 2019 onwards, has led to the decline of our import levels. Iran used to be India's third largest crude oil supplier up until April 2019. In the current financial year, India has tried to make up for the loss of Iranian crude by importing additional crude oil from the US and Kazakhstan and by also signing a new pact with Russia. Moving on to the consumption aspect. Refineries in the country use crude oil as a raw material or input to manufacture petroleum products. India has consumed almost 5.09 million barrels per day in the current financial year, that is 2019-20. Domestic consumption of crude oil has increased at a CAGR of 3.6% during financial year 15-19, indicating a rise in the energy requirements of the country, given ours is a growing economy as well. In the current financial year, the crude oil processed by the Indian refiners has fallen by 1.2% due to the weak fuel demand, which has led to an inventory buildup of refined petro products, thus leading to trimming of crude processing activities. Indian refineries are capable of processing sweet crude and sour crude effectively and are able to produce LPG, NAFTA, motor spirit, air turbine fuel, superior kerosene oil, high-speed diesel, light diesel oil, lubes, fuel oil, low sulfur heavy stock and bitumen. Transportation fuels such as diesel and petrol account for 57% of the total refinery products followed by NAFTA and LPG. NAFTA is used as a feedstock in fertilizer and petrochemical firms, whereas LPG is used as a cooking fuel. Trend in oil prices. Trend in oil prices is a very important aspect to consider while analyzing the oil and gas industry. Brent oil is one of the main benchmarks which serves as a reference price for buyers and sellers. Having a benchmark crude oil makes it easier for sellers and buyers to determine the prices of multitudes of crude oil varieties and blends, as there are nearly 200 varieties of crude oil. India uses, Indi India uses the Indian basket of crude as a benchmark crude. It is also used as an indicator as the price of crude oil imports in the country and the government of India watches the index while examining the domestic price issues. The composition of Indian basket of crude represents average of Oman and Dubai for SAR grades and dated Brent for a sweet grade in the ratio of crude oil process during the previous financial year. Due to its large stature in the crude oil market, Brent crude oil prices are often influenced by a number of factors. These factors influence the price of just about any crude oil blend. However, because it's a benchmark, it tends to be more sensitive to these factors other than the other crude oil blends. Prices of crude oil are highly positively correlated with the other benchmark crude oil prices as well. Now, the factors which influence oil prices. So oil prices are a function of global supply and demand. The prices of crude oil are also influenced by the political and economic conditions prevailing in major oil producing and refining countries as well. Tension in the Middle East also tends to influence oil prices. Environmental hazards too have an effect on oil prices as it has the potential to stall 
oil production. When it comes to macroeconomic policies and its influence on oil prices, it is expected that a strong economy is likely to increase the demand for crude oil and on the other hand, an economic crisis will lead to a decline in oil prices. Level of supply of crude oil in the economy is an important detriment as well as a factoring crude oil prices. That means that if the supply is less, then there are chances of prices of crude oil projecting upwards. Hence, OPEC's decisions are important in the oil market because OPEC owns about two-thirds of the global oil market. If OPEC decides to cut down on production, the supply will reduce, leading to an increase in crude oil prices. But in also in the past few years, USA has been emerging as one of the key players in the world oil and gas markets and has been able to exercise considerable influence on global benchmark oil prices, given the surplus production of oil. Now, just to give a little perspective and understanding of how crude oil prices has been in this in uh, CY19 and in the current year. Oil prices had increased during April 19 as the U.S. government did not grant additional extension to India, Japan, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Taiwan, South Korea, and China on the Iran sanction waiver. The anticipation of the loss of supply of Iranian crude thus led to a rally in oil prices. But shortly, the oil prices started falling due to the bearish sentiments in the economy due to the tensions, trade tensions between US and China, coupled with the ever increasing US production. In the new year, despite the implementation of the production cuts undertaken by OPEC and its allies, the prices of crude oil have fallen even further and have entered the bear markets due to the outbreak of the novel coronavirus, which has led to denting global oil demand. The price of Indian basket of crude is approximately US dollars 0.3 to 0.6 barrels less than the Brent oil price on a monthly basis. Impact on inflation. Increase or decrease in the prices of crude oil has a significant impact on inflation as it will be driving the monetary policy decisions in future. The table on the screen gives the weight of crude oil and its products in the two main inflation indices, the Wholesale Price Index and the Consumer Price Index. Crude oil and its products have a weight of 10.4% in, in the WPI. I'm sorry. Of this, crude oil and natural gas have a weight of 2.41% and mineral oils have a weight of around 7.95%. With the exception of LPG and kerosene, which have a combined weight of 0.83%, the rest of them would be driven by market forces. Therefore, any increase or decrease in crude oil price would tend to impact the WPI more commensurately. In the case of CPI, the impact of crude oil prices is directly related to the pass-through of the transportation fuels which has a weightage of approximately only 2.39%. Thus, increase or decrease in the crude oil prices will impact the WPI more than it will impact the CPI. The government is impacted by oil prices in two ways. First, the government, both center and state, earn substantial revenues from oil and oil products through taxation. As they have been kept out of the GST purview, states are also able to le levy variable taxes, as a result of which prices across states vary. The state governments, the government also earns income in the form of dividends from oil companies in which it has a promoter stake in. Secondly, the government is also able to provide subsidy for certain fuel products, which is LPG and kerosene, in order to buffer against the prices. In terms of the table provided on this screen, uh, which is talking about the total contribution of the petroleum sector towards the exchequer during FI19, so it has been around uh, rupees 5.27 lakh crores, out of which exercise duty and VAT constitute around 70% of the total contribution. Taxes levied by the center are a fixed amount, whereas state governments not only follow a different tax regime, but also levy taxes on an ad valorem basis. 
the this slide out here since uh, is just to show as much uh, is the idea to get how exercise duty and VAT make up and are important components of the fact uh, factors price of petrol and diesel since the nationwide rollout of GST uh, crude oil petrol diesel ADF and natural gas have been kept out of the GST ambit as of February 16 2020 the government center plus state has collected around 107 percent taxes uh, ex, uh, excise duty and VAT on the base price of petrol and 69% in the case of diesel. The last part from my end which is this fuel subsidy. The fuel subsidy used to be as high as rupees 97,000 crore during FY13. Efforts have been made, however, to make this amount lower by restricting the amount of products which need to be subsidized as well as to target them more effectively. The revised estimate for FY20 is around Rs. 38,569 crore and the fuel subsidy for the year FY21 has been budgeted at Rs. 40,915 crore. The government has increased the fuel subsidy by 6.1%. Within the subsidy, the allocation towards the LPG subsidy has increased by 9.3% and decreased the and the kerosene subsidy has come down by 18.4%. Over the years, kerosene consumption has decreased and the penetration of LPG has gained traction. Kerosene consumption has declined by 29.6% and 7.9% during FY18 and 19 respectively because of the reduced allocation to states and the voluntary surrender of the public distribution system quota by a few states. It is also speculated that the government will eventually stop giving kerosene subsidies and focus on only subsidizing LPG, given that the PMUY has led to the wider coverage of LPG distribution network. With this, I would now like to hand over the presentation to my colleague and the oil and gas rating sector specialist, Mr. Manik Narung, to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Urvisha, and welcome all the participants. Uh, I'll take forward uh, from here with respect to the uh, rating methodology. Uh, so initially, we'll discuss about the rating methodology of stream oil companies. So exploration and production companies engage primarily in the exploration, development, production, and sale of crude oil and natural gas. The assessment of the EMP companies is influenced by the fact that these companies' assets are finite, depleting resources subject to unpredictable commodity prices. Further, these companies need to reinvest substantial amounts to replace their depleting reserves. The, re the reserve re replacement and the financial position of these companies can be affected by volatility in the commodity prices and by geological surprises during exploration and production. Over the time, the credit quality of such companies is determined by the operating returns on invested capital and more specifically, the amount spent in acquiring, finding, and developing acreage and reserves. The different stages of ENP value chain are geological and geophysical activity, exploratory drilling, development drilling, and finally production. Now I move to the major risk drivers in the EMP sector. So initially we'll start with the business risk drivers and then we'll come to the financial risk drivers. So in the business risk drivers, the scale of operations in terms of the production volume of an upstream company is important as it indicates the past track record of successful exploration and development across basin and geologies. And second, the ability to undertake the large capex and deploy the latest technologies required for exploration and development. Along with scale, mix of oil and gas in production is considered when higher proportion of crude oil is more favorable owing to higher realization on an energy equivalent basis and ease of transportation. Diversification of the producing fields across Basins, geologies, geographies, and countries are assessed to determine the vulnerability of cash flows to any operational or force major risks. In the case, 
the cash flows are derived only from one producing field, the company is exposed to asset concentration risk. Diversification of assets in a number of geographical regions and geological basins mitigate geopolitical and geological risks attached with asset concentration. The next comes the reinvestment risk. It includes the reserve replacement, like the reserve replacement is the most fundamental challenge an ENP company faces to sustain the cash flows in future years. Oil and gas that is produced must be replaced with newly discovered or purchased reserves. An ENP company that consistently replaces the oil and gas it produces with fresh reserves and does so at economic rate of return is more likely to survive economic industry and commodity cycles. Key rating metrics which are considered by care is reserve replacement ratio, which is the ratio of reserves added in a given year versus that year's production. Next comes the operating and capital efficiency. ENP companies are in a business where the product is a commodity such that every company is a price taker. Furthermore, ENP companies are highly capital intensive, constantly reinvesting capital and raising external debt and equity capital. Companies must rely sufficient funds on investment relative to the risk that investors take. Then comes the evacuation risk. Adequate evacuation arrangements for oil and gas can also influence the effective realization and ENP player fetches for its oil and gas. While pipeline is the most preferred and economical mode of transportation for both oil and gas, producers sometimes resort to other modes of transport such as trucks in the case of oil fields where pipeline option is not feasible or where there are delays in laying the pipelines. Additionally, delays in setting up pipelines in case of standard fields can impact the monetization and or returns from the field. Now comes the regulatory risk. ENP companies in India are significantly impacted by the regulations governing the sector. Such regulations include approval process, approval for price setting formula, prioritization of customers, direction to the PSU upstream companies to share the under recoveries of OMCs, which they have been doing in the past, now it has reduced control on gas prices, differential prices for customers in India's Northeast region, and methodology of computation of royalty. Although the crude oil prices are largely linked with global benchmarks, which Urvisha has also touched based upon, the government of India has exhibited significant control on prices of domestically produced gas. And that leads to some sort of a political risk as well. Now we come to the financial risk drivers. The first one is the operating profitability and return on capital employed. The analysis here focuses on determining the trend in the company's operating profitability vis-a-vis -vis the peers in the industry. Further, the return on capital employed needs to be analyzed to measure the efficiency with which an entity utilizes the capital deployed in its business. An entity's ability to consistently generate return on capital employed over and above its cost of capital would reflect well on its long-term business viability. The other ratio is the gearing ratio, which is total debt to total net worth, and total debt includes both short-term and the long-term debt. The objective here is to ascertain the level of debt in relation to the company's own funds and is viewed in conjunction with the business risks that the entity is exposed to. For higher rated ENP companies, CARE expects ENP companies to have low financial leverage in order to offset the high business risks. It means it should have a more financial flexibility. Then, the, then the, this part also, and the next part is the foreign currency related risk. The foreign currency risk can also arise from unhedged liabilities. The focus here is on assessing the hedging policy of the company concerned in the context of the tenor and the nature of the contracts with clients, which may include short term, long term, fixed pricing or variable pricing. And then now comes the part of the financial flexibility. 
as the enp business is capital intensive ability to raise resources from the capital or loan market at competitive rates will be a key rating strength especially if a larger share of the field is in exploratory or development stage on the other hand if a company has a large proportion of its assets in the production stage cash flows from then can partially partly or fully support the exploration and development capex besides also enhancing the ability of the company to raise capital from markets now as the screen you can see on the screen that there are uh, these are mean these are only the care rated entities which are into upstream and the other are the omc companies and the reliance industries which has the largest private sector refined in india so mainly the other than for other than reliance all are government owned companies so we derive a lot of comfort from the sovereign ownership and as a result the rating is triple a rating so ongc all india are the upstream companies as i stated and bpcl chennai petroleum and reliance industries are the downstream refineries now being very strong in their financials and having a very strong parentage from the screen uh, the participants can see the uh, rating has been consistently at the top notch of triple uh, a rated and has remained stable because though the performance gets uh, impacted due to the uh, you know change in the crude oil however there is a there is a support from uh, the sovereign and have uh, reliance industries have deep pockets to sustain any kind of a, uh, a major volatility in the crude prices so that is why the ratings are uh, at triple a band or triple a now we come to the next slide which tells us about key ratings factors which have been considered and why uh these ratings are at triple a so major factors leading to the highest ratings of the companies in this industry are the first one is a strong parentage it is mainly sovereign for most of the cases in fact barring reliance and reliance otherwise is a very strong entity in terms of cash flows strategic importance of the sector for government of india so government of india control its upstream activities through ongc though it has no a lot has been uh, you know focus has been on the private sector uh, however still uh, because of it requires uh, a lot of capital it's a capital intensive fixed capital intensive industry and very regulated industry so private sector participation is yet to come we are yet to see very significant in a very significant manner though it has come up with Uh, oil p uh, like of things and then there's a flexibility with regards to the raising of the funds at competitive prices and uh, they have the strong uh, operational profile driven by the dominant market position so the key takeaways from the rating aspects would be that the domestic upstream is dominated by large public sector undertakings like ongc and oil india though there is a private in the private domain there is a cane india also which is a vedanta group company and this psu contribute around 3/4 of total india's oil and gas output by volume the other thing is uh, though the data has improved over a period of time but still we still lack a lot of robust data in terms of knowing the geology of or the kind of uh, you know estimation in terms of the volume of the production of crude or gas and then there is a delay in decision making and regulatory clearances as i stated it's a highly regulated there are regulators like there's a dgh this oil ministry so there a lot of uh, approvals are still required though though in past year a lot of policies have come to to expedite the decision making but still it is still there and that is the reason that has led to the uh, you know subdued interest from the private sector so with this i uh, end up with the presentation and i hand over this to uh, mridul um thank you pat uh, thank you manik sir 
Uh, dear participants, yeah. we would now be taking a break of two minutes before we come back to take your queries. You are requested to start keying in your questions in the slot provided. We have a question which is asking for what is our outlook on the oil prices going forward? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we believe that oil prices will not ri uh, rise more than at least uh, $57 per barrel at the moment, given the outbreak of the coronavirus has spread to other countries as well. And this has severely affected the global demand growth prospects. We also have to keep in mind that China is the uh, one of the biggest uh, oil uh, consuming countries and it's on a complete total shutdown at the moment. So considering that and the spread of the virus, we think that it won't be exceeding 57 uh, US dollars per barrel. Probably in the summer months, there could be chances of it going even further increasing it. Uh, we believe it could be $57 uh, till some kind of, uh, you know, a cure or some remedy has been proposed, then that could definitely lift the sentiments of the uh, oil traders. We have another question which says, what's the impact of the Bharat 6 fuel type in India in the oil industry? So um, since this is government mandated, the refineries, the refiners had no choice but to implement it. And by April 1st, 2020 onwards, uh, the, uh, the refineries will be uh, rolling out with uh, Bharat 6 fuel. Now, uh, what the impact has been, 
is that over the time period, at least I think a good two years were given to them. Uh, all the refineries had to go through upgradation of their uh, of their machinery and capex. Also invest in some capex so that they can produce a Bharat 6 fuel type. The Bharat 6 fuel type is supposed to be less polluting. That means it has less sulfur content in it. So in that way, it has led to an increase in the capex requirements. Uh, it is also speculated that uh, in order to recover the capex money spent on these upgradation, the refiners could probably levy an increased fee or something on the fuel. So that is another impact on the oil industry. So this is more of a refiner's point of view. We can see an impact coming in, not for a very upstream company per se. We have another question which says, uh, which inflation is more, uh, which inflation indices, how does oil, how does the oil industry impact the RBI decisions? So the oil prices uh, lead to increase or decrease, whatever it may be. So let's assume that if it's an increase in the oil prices, that also leads to increasing the inflation in the country, but the RBI, uh, monitors the CPI closely and in considers the CPI inflation while uh, coming out with the MPC decision if it's hawkish or do, uh, dovish. So it is uh, more looking into the CPI index, not the WPI per se. I think that was the last question taken up for the day because there are no more queries coming in. Um, uh, thank you participants for taking your time out and being part of this care ratings webinar. Uh, in case of any further queries, uh, suggestions or feedback, you're most welcome to write to us in the comment box, which will be coming no sooner the webinar ends. Thank you and good talk to you. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you.